not making this up. I document it. I have had to hold pirates off at sea in the Caribbean with an AR-15. I actually had to sail through the Isle of Hurricane once. My boat burned up and left the castaway at sea once. And I had to get rescued by a cargo ship. Wyland said the ocean stirs the heart, inspires the imagination, and brings eternal joy to the soul. Let's investigate that. Hello everyone, I am Taylor Jane from Sailing Trinity. Welcome to a special five-part series that is serving as an intermission to our Around the Islands in 80 Days voyage. Unlike our usual stories of Greek mythology, in this series we dive instead into the modern tales of present-day sailors. We will explore their most memorable moments at sea, be it for better or for worse, the valuable lessons they've learned as a result of this lifestyle, and their personal personal advice on living freely and fully. As I venture off on my personal travels this summer, I invite you to join us here every fortnight to dive deeper into a different colorful chapter of these extraordinary lives. Take a second now to subscribe and like the video before we jump in. Once again, I'm Taylor Jane and these are your storytellers for today. Here we go. Interview Ready? Take two. Go. <laughs> 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 my name's Keena. I'm from Australia. This is my third boat and we probably have had boats now for what seven years? Eight years? And I'm James Skinner. I uh, I've been sailing since about 2000 so about 25 years now. So I've mostly sailboats and catamarans and now I've got a motor yacht. <laughs> take that one. Yep. <laughs> I basically told Keena, this is what we're doing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and do you want to come along? And that is largely how it, no, I was actually manipulating her for about nine years. Fantasy. Yeah. But to yeah. be fair, I think I was 35 when I first dreamt about retiring. So I couldn't wait to get out of the telecoms rat race yes. and slow down. And boating's just a fabulous way to do it. Beautiful. Yes, so we basically looked around for a long, long time mm -hmm. to find a boat to buy. We looked in America, we looked in Europe, we looked in England, um, we looked at sailboats, catamarans, motorboats, ended up with this one, which turned out to be a complete and utter refit. But it was a kind of a a good price to start off with. So the name of our boat, I think that was the question. We originally found a boat in America that was named Dogstar. Okay, that was like the smoking deal. I think that it even got around here that that boat's gone back up for sale again. And we were on the plane to fly over there and uh, and the broker sold it out from underneath it to oh. one of his friends. Anyway, but we remembered the name and we were really crushed about losing that boat and mm -hmm. everything. So when we got this one, there was this whole secret going on that was supposed to be, I've named it Dog Star, I got all these Dog Star names mm -hmm. made up and all this stuff. And it was supposed to be when the boat got done, we came out and we unveiled it to Kina and she would find out we named it Dog Star after the dog and after that other boat. But it is a rule in our house that I name the dogs and James names the boats. Okay, I support that. My hidden feature is, so when we originally got these, this whole solar array made up, mm -hmm. we had an eyebrow put on it, mm -hmm. and it was supposed to be for a cover to go on there, so it gave it kind of a cool look, mm -hmm. but they never got the cover done. We've got a, a handheld uh, navigation system, so mm -hmm. you can navigate the boat just from the handheld. Very cool. And so what you could do where that little eyebrow is, it turned out that you can go stand up there and helm the boat from up there and then it, it just wraps around you so now I just use that the whole time to home the boat when I'm at sea and you get like full 360 view and everything okay. you wouldn't know that just look at it but it's it's a really cool feature that sort of evolved out of an, an error Kina? the thing I like about this boat and it's not necessarily a hidden feature I must admit but um, it's just all the space like you can walk around the whole boat there's you know it's not a sailboat so there's no sails there's no sort of winches there's none of that sort of stuff and 
there's just loads of space to do a barbecue on the back of the boat. You can sit on the front of the boat, put your feet up on the front of the boat and just watch the world go by. And, you know, quite often we've been doing that and, you know, there's been dolphins and sea turtles and stuff. And, and it's really peaceful. I like that a lot. Beautiful. This is a Vandervolk, which Vandervolk with his two brothers, they got into an argument with each other. And uh, so one brother left and started making super yachts. But this was one of the very last hulls that they made as brothers. And it actually sat up for a couple of years just as a hunk of metal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, okay, you don't like the story, it's fine. <laughs> anyway, it's got an interesting history behind it. It's Dutch. It's a Dutch boat, yep. That's such a cool story. So we've done quite a lot of the canals and the River Thames in mm -hmm. the UK. Been through the middle of France, and we've been on the lower part of France, around Corsica. We've been through Italy, uh, we did a honeymoon in Croatia, and we are now in Greece. And James has done some other sailing. I can honestly say, I, and I'm not making this up, I can document it, I have had to hold pirates off at sea in the Caribbean with an AR-15. You, when you're near Haiti and stuff, mm -hmm. there's, it gets really wacky out there. I actually had to sail through the Isle of Hurricane once. My boat burned up and left the castaway at sea once. And I had to get rescued by a cargo ship. That was a character building experience. <laughs> I still had like I scars imagine. all over me from where the sails caught fire and sort of raining, burning Dacron down. So I had a lot of crazy stuff like that happening, mostly sailing the Atlantic because the Atlantic can be quite nasty, um, especially when you get up near Hatteras Inlet. Sometimes you can get very early season storms and that's when I got caught one time coming back from uh, Bermuda and it just happened and before you know it. But mostly I've stayed uh, you know, in that area, East Coast, Caribbean, all the way down to the Windward Islands, Puerto Rico. Um, I haven't really sailed the Pacific, I haven't sailed the Pacific at all. And then on the other side over here, you know, uh, sailing around Europe and stuff. But I've not really done any of the Pacific or anything like that. Talk about, starts with an F, ends with an E, France. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the branch was really frightening. Well, so we basically started our journey in this boat by coming through France from Le Havre in the north down to Marseille, uh, Cassis in the south. So we went through like, I think three rivers and two canals. And because the boat was new, lots of things went wrong and lots of things were scary and we didn't really understand necessarily everything that was going on. But actually it was amazing fun. One of the highlights, I guess, was going through the the canal entre Bourgogne and Champagne. But, oh, that's a really bad French accent, by the way. <laughs> that's pretty bad. Um, but it's a, it's a 220 kilometer canal with, I think, 114 locks on the way up and 40 something locks on the way down, and a five kilometer tunnel at the top, which was just awesome. And that took quite some time, probably about three weeks to get through that. There were part, if, you, if you've ever heard of the movie African Queen, there were some parts <laughs> that were seriously like, like, you know, where they're like, pulling the boat through all of this we call it salad all of this green growth yes yeah, there's just not many boats that go through there so it's not clear and they have a the lock keepers get in a car and drive down to the next lock and they have these big forks and they pile the salad up to try and get you through the lock but you literally you couldn't turn your engine on because you would just suck all this salad up so you literally had to pull this boat like through the locks and down through the canals. It was crazy, man. And there were a few, we're never gonna make it moments and we have to turn around. It's not gonna happen. But we made it through it and now it's- I know, I calmed him down each time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Talk about I would say uh, many unexpected character building experiences. You know, they, they always talk about it in the military, too. It's mostly a lot of boredom with uh, just a few interjections of absolute sheer terror. Yeah. Probably three aspects to it. One is incredibly hard, back-breaking, dirty painting work that you don't expect. Maintenance. maintenance and stuff in small places. Moments of sheer terror. But mostly it's just awesome and peaceful and lovely and relaxing. So when we bought this boat, it had dinghy davits, 
right? And about halfway through the build, because remember this boat was stripped down to just bare metal. So we went from dinghy davits to the guy that was doing the rebuild going, well, why don't you just put a dinghy platform in, right? And, you know, I got sucked right in, you know, shiny penny. If you put a shiny penny, I'll go, ooh, shiny penny. Um, so yeah, yeah, we put that in. But in order to get the dinghy on and off, you had to have this paracel thing, right? That turned out to be just an amazing, useful de device because not only is it a crane, but it also is a, well, a hydraulic paracel. And I can't imagine possibly having this boat without that thing. Now. And it's a diving platform. Oh, it's just amazing. It's an amazing bit of kit. It costs about ten grand, but it's an amazing piece of kit that I never, never would have thought that I'd put on the boat. But we were sailing down the Thames in winter. I had my full winter coat on, and beanie and everything, and I was walking along the side of the boat for some unknown reason and fell in the water. Gone! All we heard was splash! Yeah, I did, I did yell out so people sort of, yeah, knew I'd fallen off. And yeah, because when I went underwater I didn't know because I had all those clothes on whether I'd even like, reach the surface or not, but I did. Um, so I swam to the other side of the river, but there was no bank, there was only branches. So I was sort of waiting on holding branches while um, James and my two friends turned the boat around came and rescued me. It was quite funny. Trying to get her in the boat was you couldn't get her in the boat because she was too heavy. You yeah. just pull her belt loops off. Yeah. So she was hanging onto a branch, you know, in the middle of the river Thames. She had to do that quick drill. You know those those that stuff you learn in sailing school and everything, you know, decades ago. Just clicks right in and you, you, know, you, you circle around and Man over but board. trying to get her in was really hard. But luckily that boat at the back of it had a little ladder, so I managed to get her to the ladder and pull her up. But without that ladder, so that's something people can know, is always be thinking about if somebody falls over how are you going to get them back in the boat because mm -hmm. people have died from that from not being able to get back in the boat it was actually when we had our first boat which was just a little little, little riverboat putt putt boat um that we could sleep in like a little glorified tent and just the fact that you absolutely had to slow everything down so you get home from work and you go out for the weekend and so that whole pace of pressure of work and then you couldn't go fast if you tried because there's a speed limit of about four knots so it was just a great way to like wind down and realize that life's more than what maybe you thought it was going to work every day that was a little motor launch that we completely restored um and it's it's actually the very first fiberglass inboard motor yacht ever in the world and they were called Freeman, Freeman 22, so it was British. And like many British things, they look wonderful and don't run worth a crap um, and constantly break down. But anyway, but they are such a cool little boat and so that was Kina's first foray into restoring a boat from scratch. Obviously this is the pinnacle of that. Well, so a lot of it, again, you know, this boat was completely rebuilt, but it's basically a riverboat, right? So I had a lot of people tell me, you know, that's a riverboat. It's not really something you want to take out on the ocean. And when you have enough people tell you that, even though you've done a lot of your own homework, it still gives you a lot of fear of like, oh my God, am I going to get out there and have a boat that's going to capsize? Mm -hmm. So I really had a lot of fear about that, but we did a lot of heavy, heavy modifications of this, including putting great big uh, keels on it and stuff. When we actually got it out on the water, it turns out it's a fantastic boat. It sails really, really well, but man, I, people had me really freaked out that, you know, the first couple of swells, the thing was going to go boink and, and capsize. So I was really quite fearful of that and uh, really kind of went overboard, I guess. I'm trying to modify it. I think the answer's been both. So we've um, decided to retire in Greece, but we don't really want to get rid of the boat. Um, so I think the plan going forward will be to be on the boat every summer and to be in the house in winter. So yeah, I just would just go anywhere and everywhere with this boat in the med, going with the flow going forwards. But learning Greek at the same time, actually committing. Would you like to say something to us in Greek? Uh, Nazisis. That means live a good life.
That's beautiful. Thank you. We wanted to get a boat that was going to be a boat we could sail internationally, right? So, you know, you see all the sailing boats around here. That's really what you need is a sailing boat to go international. When we decided on this boat, basically we decided on it because it's got such a livable space, right? It's got this big aft patio and big bedrooms and everything, but it means that you're limited to not sailing internationally. By internationally, I mean crossing oceans. So obviously what we'll do is, I mean, this is like the relaxation boat and it's just for coastal hopping from place to place to place. And I think the aspiration is really to just do the entire Mediterranean, the slow boat way would be our, would be our aspiration. Right? Mm. Definitely. You have to do it bit by bit. So you have to have, you have to sort of have a vision and then you have to take it into bite-sized chunks because it's a lot of planning and a lot of work to kind of pick up from one thing and move into something else. There's nothing special about anyone in the marina that we've met this winter that goes around sailing on boats. It's just a decision that they've made and then they've kind of made happen. And you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things you have to do. You have to think about what happens to you your house, um, when do you retire, you know, how do you organise your money, you know, there's all sorts of logistical things, but they are just things, they're kind of like administrative things, they're kind of like things that you have to do, so you just need to take it step by step, make the leap, and then never look back, right, don't think, oh, well, maybe if I did, you know, should I, shouldn't I, um, just look forwards and kind of, you know, enjoy it, because pretty much everybody that I met, that I meet, uh, that we meet on this journey, they're all loving it. Yeah, there's some simple rules that I've learned um, and, and have been taught to me by other people and then I've, I can confirm it, you know, because you're always talking to the old salts down the line. Um, and you'll notice something about a lot of old salts. Number one, you, you'll usually not see them on massive boats. So, you know, advice number one is get the smallest boat that gives you all of the benefits that you need, not don't buy some massive thing to try and look important in the marina. Uh, number two is buy a boat. Normally, unless you're going to be doing a lot of sailing and you're really adventure guys and you're really going to be going to Alaska and all this stuff, you're going to spend most of your time either on the hook or in a marina. So a lot of times it's better to buy the boat that's nicer in the marina than also sails, right? Rather than some of the mistakes I, I made, which were buying these really incredibly tough boats but they're a lot harder to live with. They've got a lot more systems and everything. Buy the boat you're gonna live on. Uh, the other thing too, other advice is, uh, one of the things you always have problems with is power, okay? So get a, you know, get a, a, a large solar system, get as many you know, uh, lithium batteries as you possibly can and have the most power you can because that really makes a difference in how well you live. Um, so those are some, some big advice things that I would, I would offer. Don't get too big a boat. Get as much power as you can, as cheaply as you can. And uh, buy the boat for what you're going to be doing, not, not, you know, not buying some incredible boat that you're never going to sail. So. Be really sure this is what you want to do. But I'd say better than 50%, probably 70% of couples that do this will buy a boat, put a whole bunch of money and energy into really fixing it up really nice, and they last two years. Most people, like the highest percentage of people, last two years. Like rent a boat for a month, right? Rent a boat for two months before you commit to buying a boat. And make sure it's really the lifestyle that you want. Um, and remember, the way to make it work is you've got to learn to do most of the maintenance and repairs and stuff yourself okay you if you try and rely on arena people to do it you're going to spend astronomical amounts of money so that that's my biggest advice is make really really sure you know that you want to do this that you can you can take this lifestyle because most people only make it two years and spend all that money and then sell their boat dogs are amazingly adaptive take your pet with you mm -hmm. lily's been really 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 good she spent her first six years i suppose five years of life in a house and she's nine and a bit and she's just awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
well behaved. Well, folks, that's it for today's stories. Don't forget to head over to our channel to catch up on our 80-day voyage around the Greek islands while you're here. We're grateful that you took the chance to escape the ordinary with us today. See you in another video. Bye.